Hi, everyone. Nolan, Bitcoiner, another episode of The Breakup. A little bit of a trouble today, coming to you from a different secret location. We're moving around a little bit, but we're in a different place today. Uh, and, you know, a lot of crazy news going on. And that's what this show really tries to focus on. We try to look at the psychological relationships that go into making dollars. We look at the psychological relationships that go into making Bitcoin, and we contrast those. And we take the news of the day and filter it through these two frames and try to get a result that we think, I think anyway, is useful when it comes to the connections we have with money and dollars and Bitcoin and all the rest. And on a weekend like this, it's really difficult to take which news story we should follow. Everything seems to be coming at once. We've got a, looks like the, the drumbeat of war is happening in Eastern Europe. We see all kinds of stuff in Russia. Looks like America has got another supply chain problem. I was pretty happy towards Christmas. It looked like we had solved the problems in Los Angeles, but I guess not. They're right back and worse than ever. We've got COVID protests all around the world. They seem to be getting even worse than ever. Uh, more cities, more people, more violence. We've got a president that gave a speech where he really looked degenerated more than I think we've seen, more than, than I think even people who are not a fan were, were prepared for. It was, it was pretty stark. And then, of course, Bitcoin. What are you going to say? There's all kinds of things that are going on. You get all kinds of takes. Today, what I hope to offer with a, a frame of all this, and we're going to talk more about the Bitcoin situation for sure, but what I hope to offer what I set out to offer was a frame that's more useful than just zoom out. I, I, I think in the end, it might just be zoom out. I think it's close enough to real that you can get it. But maybe if you're wondering what just zoom out means, maybe if you had more questions about just zoom out, maybe this is good for you. So, or, or maybe it's not. Please leave feedback and let me know if this is more beneficial at the end than just zoom out. I'll try to frame it up with just zoom out at the end and we'll see if this stands out and, and, and has some benefit beyond just zoom out, which you hear over and over again in these, in these crashes. And I think it's a really useful frame, just zoom out, definitely. But I hope to explain why just zoom out exactly is important. So today, if we're going to talk about psychology. We're going to talk about all that's going on in the world and these relationships. I'm going to start with one of the best psychological frames you can offer from what many consider one of the fathers, anyway, of modern psychology, and that's Carl Jung. Carl Jung talked about something called synchronicity. Synchronicity is basically when you see two things that are coincidental, there is no cause and effect between them, but that the coincidence is greater than can be explained by pure chance. It looks like we've learned more and more that coincidences, even strange coincidences are pretty common, actually, and that you can explain away a lot of synchronicity and, and this idea of you know, parallel things happening, coincidental things happening. What's really important in the case of Carl Jung is he used it as a method to combat anxiety. What he said was, you can look at the whole world through a cause and effect lens, but that these particular coincidences do have meaning for people, and that meaning can really help them overcome things that are sort of beyond their control necessarily. He used one great example of, and this was the one he believed his whole life, he had a patient as a psychologist that he had a lot of trouble healing, all kinds of anxiety, trying to heal the mind with the mind type of thing, trying to, trying to get over it, trying to think through it, trying to get past it. And he kept saying, sort of, your ego is in the way, it's not going to work. And she'd had a dream about a golden beetle, and on that very day, a and a beetle that would not be native to Europe flew into the room and like literally landed in his hands against the time at which it would, should be happening and all that. And the woman saw it and she says, well, I have to just believe in these coincidences now. This is real. Someone is sending me a message. Now, Carl Jung got the idea of synchronicity and this getting away from anxiety, getting away from uh, a cause and effect world. He got the idea from the I Ching which is one of the most important Chinese texts, one of the most important texts in the world. I Ching was a prediction tool, a prediction machine, really. And when it was first designed, it was made with, I guess not even first, it went through a bunch of iterations, but they still do it with these sticks. And the sticks end up forming these hex, you know, hexagrams, these six um, broken sticks, single sticks, in arrangements of six, sticks, six, so you hear the difference? And in the end, they said it could explain everything in the world and that this mathematical formula was an excellent prediction tool for and, and could explain everything in the world. 
So people kind of, you know, would look at that, especially early Western science and say, I can't explain everything in the world. It's a bunch of sticks. But it turned out that these sticks and the system here predicted binary code. It predicted everything that we built the internet off of, everything that we've built the computer age off of. So their idea that you can explain the universe through these patterns is actually true in the end because we used it to build everything we have in the digital world. Ones and zeros, it turns into binary code. It turns into ones and zeros. The dotted lines could be thought of as a zero and the single line could be thought of as a one. And you can basically truly, like I Ching said, explain everything in the world through this model. And it ended up being really important for Jung. And it was actually used throughout the whole era of quantum physics becoming the predominant way of viewing the world in the mid part of the century, because before it was all mechanical physics. And this all dovetailed with the transition from mechanical physics over to quantum physics. So this was happening everywhere. And it happened in psychology as well. So just to understand the contrast again, you know, Freud would have said something along the lines that we have all these sexual impulses and they manifest themselves in different cause and effect ways, you become a pervert or whatever. What Jung was saying is it's not exactly that. There is our conscious, which is seeing things as they are, but there's another layer, what he called the collective unconscious. And the collective unconscious was our wills, our an unspoken language that seemed to connect us. The interesting thing, again, about in the end about the I Ching is this, and this is where everything about the predictive model becomes important, everything about simulation theory even comes from. With very long numbers, with I Ching, you're actually able to see, with certain predictions, the manifestation of intention, right? So there's a way to measure the deviation from pure probability against it could even be rolling dice. You could roll dice if you roll them enough and you have an intention to produce something. We have seen it manifest itself mathematically, empirically, proven, huge delta between what you'd expect in, in probabilistic terms and what you end up getting. They're not the same thing. The, the manifestation of intention becomes obvious in this case. And I, I don't know enough about the math to prove it. Please go and look at it yourself. But basically, you can see, and it becomes really obvious when you make low probability predictions. So go back to the zoom out argument and look at Bitcoiners. Bitcoiners made a prediction already 10 years ago that it would be a global macro asset. At the time, insane, like crazy, right? No one's working for it. No one's there. And of course, now it's a legitimate thing. There's no denying it's a, it's a real global macro asset with a role to play in current incredibly complex financial contortions and change, right? <clears throat> so the book of change, literally the book of change, is where you even get the dynamics that go into the yin and yang theory. That's where it comes from. That it isn't a cause and effect, that there's a messiness to it, that there is a, a certain part of it that isn't going to give you the clear answer, but it's going to show you the direction. We'll show you directionally where things are headed. So what I thought is if we would take this prediction model, and, and it's always why we think predictions are so important on this show and, and in general. Bitcoiners made predictions a long time ago. What I see here in 2022 is a world that a lot of Bitcoiners already predicted. Maybe not the pandemic part, but certainly the macroeconomic environment was foretold a long time ago by Bitcoiners. So now let's just take a look. We, we see all this happening and people are saying, oh, well, Bitcoin's getting smashed in the face and all these really bad things are happening in the world. What are we going to do? Well, let's take that predictive model. Let's take, we're not going to do it with sticks and I Ching. We'll just try and, and, and look at it here. But let's just look at the probabilistic outcomes now. Let's look at how different probability has become. So when I look, for example, at COVID, when I look at all this arguments, people are afraid there's going to be mandates around the world. It's an excuse to make us all train to wear masks and then get an app and then the app is going to control our life and all this stuff. But I saw on a TV program on Friday night, Barry Weiss, who I think is a pretty important voice these days, uh, getting an applause from what I would consider a liberal audience in general on the Bill Maher show on HBO. And that wouldn't be what a lot of people would expect. You saw a hugely liberal audience supporting this idea. And, and that was sort of against what, what you would be told would, would be a, a typical Democrat thought. You can even then apply that same distinction to war, perhaps, with Russia. Do you think 
in this current environment, there is any leader capable of mobilizing Americans to support a war against Russia. I don't know. I mean, you can hear it on the news. There's a lot of people on either side saying there's a lot of trouble. But like anything, Americans are not exactly as opposite as everyone says. I don't think that a lot of Republicans really believe in the end or, or are going to be convinced that all Democrats are Antifa people, right? They're not. And the other way is true. I don't think a lot of Democrats are going to be convinced that all Republicans are fascist. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to settle in anything great. It just means we're not going to be pulled to either side of that. So you've got the makings of what Bitcoin predicted would be a sweet spot, American anarchy. And American anarchy doesn't have to mean we're killing each other and eating each other at all. It just means you're like responsible for your keys, but you're also responsible for being civilized and helping your neighbor and helping other people and extending your own personal freedom to its limit. But basically, extending it to a limit where you ain't my boss and I ain't your boss and we're all just getting along. You're not my bank. I don't have to ask you for anything. And, and we're in that world where, where we're not subjugated to the power authority of another person, right? So, so when I see it, Bitcoin worldview, we're getting closer and closer to what Bitcoiners said would happen, far closer to that result than we are the other way around and going backwards and reinstalling all the systems that are in place today and, and revitalizing them, right? So what we're saying is entropy has come into those previous systems. Clown world, right? Clown world theory is a real thing, right? I'm a proponent of clown world theory. I, I don't believe in, in, you know, I think there are people with bad intentions for sure. And I think they might have been around for a long time too, right? That's, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is they're really dumb, right? There's a lot of dumb people out there. That show Veep is more accurate about what's going on in Washington, D.C. If anyone has never seen Veep, it's more accurate. The one with Elaine from Seinfeld, that show is more accurate about what's going on in politics than the West Wing from the 1990s. I worked in executive level politics for a long time. They're morons. They're dumb people. Like anyone, like any industry, really smart people, really dumb people. The institutions are hard to wield. They produce results that you'll never understand. An example I like to use in the Biden administration is when there was that news at the beginning that they had fired a bunch of staffers for smoking pot, right? It might have been true. It might have been true. It made the news and a lot of right wing people said, oh, look how dumb that Biden is. He loved pot. Now he fired all the pot heads and da, 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 da. Well, that's not what happened at all. Probably some dumb committee of people got together and produced a result that no human being would ever understand. Only a committee come, could come up with a dumb solution like that, fire them, right? So it probably happened, but it doesn't mean it's the responsibility of one person. It just shows the institutions are decrepit and not going to produce results that we would recognize as you know, human readable. So when we look at all of these problems in the world today, and supply chains being the one that I really want to mention because it's important for what I think is that long tail news that we have to look at and that we have to focus on. And that is more about the manifestation of the intentions of Bitcoiners that will have a larger impact on the future than any of the news I just mentioned. And that was Intel last week saying they would create the low voltage ASIC chips. That's not even necessarily just great for Bitcoin. That's great for the whole world of mining in this way. Of, of distributed computer systems that have one specific job, in the case of Bitcoin, mining Bitcoin. But to be able to have a cloud of these ASIC chips is a completely new way to organize networks and has a lot of potential and a lot of promise. And Bitcoin is really showing the way on how this works. Now, you can see this as just this little tiny news story. But in the end, it's actually an answer to American supply chain problems. The industry is pivoting. It's finding ways to solve these problems. And it's bringing chip making back to America, which I think in the whole scheme of things right now is really important for that outcome for American anarchy to really work. Right? If you've got chips being made here, if you've got domestic production of things again in America, America can sort of focus on itself and getting over its problems and, and, and coming together in ways that make sense for the country. Now, when you, when you look at, at these predictions and you run it through that model, again, the contrast for me that's so important is if we follow the line where we're afraid of what's about to happen, we're not going to win this fight and da, da 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 what has to happen is we actually have to go to war with 
Russia, I guess. We have to actually fight each other every single day. We have to continue all this stuff. It could happen. I mean, supply chains are not good. I don't think we're going to be creating as much stuff and consuming as much stuff as we used to. That's all. There's still pain. It's not that easy. But the long tail of it, when we zoom out, if you will, when you zoom out and you see what's actually going on, you see that America is solving super important problems and Bitcoin is at the heart of it. Bitcoin is at the heart of this chip repatriation. And it's at the heart of a lot of changes that I think will guarantee that the clown world simply can't perpetuate into the future. People don't want it. They're not going to choose it. They're going to choose to end those relationships and do simple things like save their money in Bitcoin. So that's today's episode, I Ching, synchronicity. Um, and another thing I want to mention about the synchronicity part, this crash, all this stuff happened on 1 21 right? One word of caution about synchronicity and finding patterns and I Ching, it's actually the start of early onset of psychosis, right? So you can go too far with it, right? You can go too far in finding meaning between these different symbols. So be careful of that. But other than the worry of psychosis, um, you know, have fun, look at these patterns and certainly apply prediction models because they help you both understand what you meant when you said it, and they can actually help change the world. We can reauthor the simulation with our intention. <laughs>